This video was originally recorded July 2018 at the home of Robert and Nena Thurman in Woodstock, New York. To learn more about the ongoing work of Bob Thurman, please visit BobThurman.com. So, hello everybody. How are you? Uh, this is a short thing on this book, which is a reprint and a new edition of a book that was published by the Library of Tibetan Work and, Ar and, and Archives, Works and Archives, in Dharamsala, I think in the 1970s, I believe in the 1970s, in which I, or some of my translations, and an introduction by me also, and um, Life and Teachings of Dzongkhapa, and also um, the translations of other texts by Dzongkhapa that had been done by other people. Um, and uh, I was at the time, as a young youngish at the time, translator, still in my 30s, because I edited this in the 70s, early 70s, uh, I was trying to show ecumenism by not changing terminology uh, much of a lot of the people who did the other translations to show that even though I didn't necessarily approve of that, ter that terminology. And in this second edition, I have a little bit edited a little more of their terminology. And, but left still the gist of their work intact, and because I still feel we should be ecumenical. Although I also feel now at my age in my 70s, 40 years later, that finally one of these days we have to come down to a meeting of minds, all the translators, as the Tibetans did under the Emperor Tisong Detzen in the 9th century late 8th, early 9th century, when they translated the first draft, you could say, of the Kandyur and Tendyur, the collection of Buddha's own scriptural works and the collection of the scientific treatises and commentaries on those works. Um, they set a kind of catalog of terminology, like a, like a concordance of terminology, and people were expected to stick to it, and they more or less did. And what is nice about that is that, to some extent, the reader in the new language, who doesn't know the old language, can find the same connections between words as the people in the original language. But it's not perfect, and it never will be, because actually, in different sectors of the original Sanskrit, you know, whether it's logician, epistemology, high philosophy, dharma practice, meditative technology, etc., in the different zones of the even arts and sciences and medicine, etc., sometimes the same Sanskrit word will have a different meaning in the original, actually. <laughs> so, in a way, it can't be absolutely perfect. But, for someone to read two different translators of works of this in the same area and have a completely different word for a word that does mean the same thing, in those two different works from the same area, like say in Madhyamaka. That's kind of too bad. Although, because the way people are, translators are, and they become, they like certain words, we could have sometimes two or three options. But really no more than that, maybe, you know. And maybe some discussion of when, which of those options is more useful in like a, you know, Oxford Dictionary level translator's dictionary, which we hope to get to one of these days, maybe in my next life. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, it's a great work. It has a lot of, um, because it's because of Dzongkhapa, it's great. And we're in a great year for Dzongkhapa, because in December of, um, or we're approaching the great year of Dzongkhapa, in December of 2019 is the 600th anniversary of Dzongkhapa's Parinirvana, you could say, or you could call it, uh, maybe that's not the right word, you call it his Yuganada, in tantric context, his attainment of the communion body, as I like to call it. People, some people will call it simply union. Some people will call it um, integration. I used to call it integration body. 
but uh, I have reason now for wanting to call it communion body, and I think that's the best. And um, but only my opinion. And um, um, at the moment of death, and the reason he hadn't attained that before was communion body. You have to have you have to be male and female yourself in one body, sort of. But therefore, two bodies, two one person in two bodies. You could say like two lovers who are so deeply in love that in a way they're fully empathetic with each other and they feel each other's feelings and yet they are separate feeling the other's feeling and so they're sort of both separate and and united and the come in the communion is what makes that integration and union make it seem like they just became one and neither one is sort of separately appreciated that in their own way so communion means two people as one and two both like a little more challenging, non-dual, you know. And that's, that's why I like that. And I, I don't care that it happens to fit with some Christian term, but um, that's just as well. It's a nice term. It means a nice thing in Christianity, but it doesn't mean this, but it means a nice thing. And you know, future Oxford English Dictionary will have Buddhist meaning and Christian meaning. And Buddhist one will uh, be a little sexier. <laughs> anyway, anyway, so... Uh, that's about translation terminology. Anyway, in, in re-editing this book for wisdom, and this also is a nice occasion, I can announce our, our new partners. I, When I say our, I mean the American Institute of Buddhist Studies, founded in 1973 in New Jersey, and then a long time at Amherst, and then a long time now here in Woodstock, and also in, um, in New York at Columbia University, affiliated with the Center for Buddhist Studies there and Tibet House. And so those three institutions have a program to translate all of the works, all of the scientific treatises in the Tibetan collection of translations from the Sanskrit originals coming from mostly Sanskrit, also some other Indian languages, uh, or, or coming from the great libraries of India, the libraries of Alexandria of India that were destroyed 700 years later or 800 years later than the Library of Alexandria was by religious fanatics in both cases. Christians in the case of Library of Alexandria and Muslims in the case of the ones in India. And so that valuable collection, so we have that. And then we used to distribute the books we published, about 30, 40 books, I lost count a little bit, uh, with Columbia University Press. And then we decided, decided as I'm retiring that it would be better, and Columbia was on board with it, to have them distributed and co-published even by Wisdom Publications, who I had always originally wanted to work with, actually, but couldn't do so in the past. But now is the perfect time. So although this one is just a wisdom book, and I did for them, I did the re-editing, and, and the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives kindly gave permission to reprint an Engl American edition, uh, second edition. And um, But then future books of this of this type, within this, co this collection, you know, from the from the um, um, Tenjur and Kanjur uh, will come out jointly between Institute of Buddhist Studies and, um, and, and, and Tibet House and um, Center for Buddhist Studies and Wisdom Publications. So we haven't really made a big fuss about announcing that because we plan to have a website thing which has delayed in being completed, but we're already working on the first books. And this is kind of an announcement of it. So, so I'm very, so I'm very delighted with our new partners at, uh, you know, Tim McNeil, uh, Daniel Aiken, uh, David Kittlestrom, and Thomas Yarnell and me and um, Christian Bredemeyer. You know, the sort of the three people on the committee, six people on the committee. Okay, so here it is, and uh, I thought actually maybe to to uh, would be very good. There is a. A wonderful thing that I don't think has any been published anywhere else in this, which has to do with um, a Nyingma Kadam Lama called uh, Lotak, Lotak Kenchen Namka Gyansen, who lived in the same time as Zonkapa. He was a little older than Zonkapa. And um, he is very worshipped and revered. He was a Nyingma and a Kadampa combination because not everyone in Tibet was sectarian at all, really, very much. 
And uh, there are, in this book also has things from Kagyus and Sakyas and Yingmas, because Tsongkhapa had many teachers from those schools. In fact, the Sakyas in particular were kind of sad that Tsongkhapa's great renaissance that he did was not sort of in, in the, within the framework of the Sakya order, but instead he chose a less powerful and by that time more diminished uh, order called the Kadam order. And his main patrons were in the Kagyu order, actually. The Pagmojuba Kagyus, the Jigun Kagyus, and others were mainly his main patrons of Tsongkhapa. And so, you know, the Kadam didn't have a lot of big, um, wealthy uh, Tibetan lords at the time. And, um, but that's the one he chose, the one without a wealthy patron, actually. And also another nice thing I like about Tsongkhapa, he refused, he declined, politely, the invitation of the Emperor of China at the time to go down and be honored by the Emperor of China because he knew, like, as we know, that if you do that, then they claim they own your country. <laughs> so you have to be careful about that. Uh, they tend to, even in the old days. So, you know, because they're the central country and, they, and everybody's supposed to be, like, pay tribute to them. It's their culture. So, um, there's this wonderful thing called Garland of Supremely Healing Nectars. And it's a dialogue between Karma Vajra, the Nyingma master of Lodra Kenjin, and Bodhisattva Vajrapani, actual celestial Bodhisattva, like in his angelic form, the fierce one, the one who's known as sort of representing the power of the Buddhas, you know. Avalokiteshvara represents the compassion of all Buddhas, Manjushri represents the wisdom of all Buddhas, and Vajrapani represents the power, energy, of all, and the competence of all Buddhas. And he's shown as a little bit fierce looking, usually. And so there's a verse of praise. And so this Lodha Kenshin had a dialogue with, with, with this um, Vajrapani, who he was in constant communication with, as Zongkhaba was in constant communication with Manjushri, the, the Bodhisattva of all wisdom of all Buddhas, and Avalokiteshvara also, but especially Manjushri. And um, so when he, he would teach uh, the Lodak Kenjin, and the Lodak Kenjin would see him as one with Manjushri. And when he would receive teachings from the Lodak Kenjin in Nyingma teachings, then the, he would perceive the Lodak Kenjin as, as uh, Vajrapani. And um, actually see really without difference, not just a human being there, but uh, this kind of this angel kind of being. And, uh, and this particular dialogue are answering some questions about Dzogchen, about the great completion and about advanced meditation practices that Dzongkhapa was curious about Vajrapani's view and um, tantric thing. And he's giving wonderful uh, answers. And first, before that, he makes a praise to Vajrapani, the, 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 the Lord of Secrets or the Esoteric Lord. And he says, you who are the actuality of the mind of all the Buddhas of past, present, and future, who are the great Vajradhara, Lord of Secrets, that's the sort of tantric form of Buddha, who are blessed by Buddhas as numerous as the Ganges River sands. Since your memory is like an elephant's, please teach the uttermost pinnacle of all vehicles. And uh, th that's because also in tantric scriptures, when Buddha teaches them, he is perceived by everyone who teaches as Vajradhara, who has a dark blue color and is sort of very layman, like naked like a yogi, except for a minor like covering, and uh, with a beautiful blue body, sometimes with a consort, sometimes without holding Vajra and bell and so on. And he teaches the, the Tantra. And then if he teaches Kalachakra, he looks like Kalachakra. If he teaches Sakrasambra, he looks like that. Vajrapani, you know, Guya Samaj, he looks like that. Uh, but um, uh, then he emanates himself as Vajrapani, who in a way is same and different. They discuss it a lot in Tantric texts. But then Vajrapani is the rapporteur, you know, the recorder, the one who has the perfect memory, who can remember everything that, uh, who, that is said. And he's like a savant in that, but not an idiot savant, but a savant. Like Ananda memorizes all the sutras, and uh, Manjushri is the one who helps organize all the Abhidharma. So uh, Vajrapani um, memorizes all the tantric teachings. And so that's, why he, that's what he means by the pinnacle of all the vehicles. And then he has more verses of praise. 
And one particular thing I kind of like, uh, he talks about many pitfalls that you can get into that you're that when you get into the very advanced stage and um, uh, so it's very interesting he says karma vajra and he asks he asks him about what are the pitfalls of, of perceiving the f clear light there are many who say they perceive the clear light of the void that's like ultimate reality is energy you know uh, but there are few who cultivate illumination emptiness as communion uh, that's uh, and of course i changed from integration which i used to use this is part of the second edition karmavadra there are also four points in the pitfall concerning compassion he says the pattern of error this constructive thought that arises as variety not arising as the intrinsic brilliance of clear empty awareness no matter how it arises, it never exceeds awareness, emptiness, indivisible. A person who does not understand that is said to mistake awareness as emptiness, to think that only that it's just awareness is emptiness, and awareness, emptiness, indivisible doesn't include awareness. Awareness being not only awareness of emptiness, but awareness of rel relativity, of related things. So he says, a person who does not understand that is said to mistake awareness as emptiness. The sign of error. So therefore, someone has a has a big space-like experience, and they think they've reached ultimate reality, and that their awareness just is the space, and that the any kind of differentiated experience subsequently is just some samsara and horrible nothing, and is not part of reality. So they get dualistic actually, and they then long to just disappear into this kind of nothingness. It's a very escapist and nihilistic view, mistaking awareness as emptiness. The sign of error is that he engages exclusively in the physical, verbal, and mental activities of this life, meaning that when he's in the relative world, because in fact any experience of like a blank space, even yourself as, as the blank space, that experience is still a relational experience. It's not the absolute. It is not. It's like it's only like an analogy for the absolute. It seems to be what you thought the absolute must be when you were thinking emptiness was a real thing, an objective thing outside of your subjectivity. And then when you feel feel you sort of merge in it, your subjectivity is that emptiness. So that's mistaking awareness for emptiness, if you follow me, thinking that it is emptiness. So then just it just engages in them like they all don't matter. Whatever you do doesn't matter when you're in body, speech, and mind. And in sort of relative reality, because you that real reality is out there, this is all just unreal nonsense. And this can make you careless and unethical, actually. So it's a really important error. I'm so happy. It's still here. The sign of error is that he engages. The fault of this error is that his attitude, that constructive thought does not arise in the truth body, causes everything that arises to be bound by the net of constructive thought. He becomes arrogant and his virtuous exertions, exertions are dissipated. So that's really interesting. So he has a theory that the, the, uh, the Dharmakaya lacks thought, and that just unthinking being spaced out is the Dharmakaya. And therefore, when that means that he's just stuck everywhere in constructive thought. Because actually, the experience, the think, the seeming merging one-on-one -on -one, of experiencing awareness as emptiness is itself directed by a constructive thought of, of a notion that emptiness is a vast space, as if it was of itself a thing, it had its own intrinsic reality, rather than it's only the nature of the inter infinite interrelationality, which includes experiences of seeming being out of relationality by a relative being. That's really cool. And therefore, you end up being bound completely by constructive thought because you even think that the, the, the place you can escape to is not constructive thought, but it is. And so everything is constructive thought, that means. But then you don't think that that makes any difference, that constructive thought, because you think there's a place outside of it. <laughs> All constructive thoughts are empty means simply that they are there. And there's nothing absolute about any of them, including the constructive notion of emptiness as objectively being there. And being an object of awareness, even non calling it non-dual, but 
it's still objective. It still had a boundary. There was a time before you had it. And there seems to be an aftermath when you finish meditating on it, when you fall out of it. And then it's all nothing where you are, because you're trapped and your virtuous exertions are dissipated. Since his practice emphasizes bad instincts, he achieves only the aims of this life. You just run around wanting to have fun in a negative way, not caring about the harm that you may cause in any particular version of it. Bound by the chains of dualistic suspicions and doubts, he himself binds himself. So then he thinks, oh, other people, you know, they're not respecting me as the one who realized emptiness, so I'm so great, you know. The effect of this error, not knowing the pitfalls of constructive thought, meaning incorrect and inaccurate and unhelpful constructive thought, he becomes fixated in his instincts. He can't resist his impulses, that means. Not knowing the evils of causality, because he thinks it's all unreal, he ends his life while still on the path of vacillation. In vacillation there meaning specifically going back and forth from a state of obliteration, which he thinks is safe, absolute, ultimate dharmakaya, and then other things which he thinks is just garbage. It's vacillating back and forth. And after death he gets lost again in the three realms of self-centered living and suffering. Karma Vajra, that's because Karma Vajra means what he calls, what Vajrapada himself calls, Kenjan Lojat Namka Gyansan, who himself is a Nyingma. And a Kata, because he could be both easily in those days. There are many who say they have no constructive thoughts, but there are few who understand the criterion for the liberation of whatever, the natural liberation of whatever arises. Meaning, Non-duality non -duality knows emptiness as relativity and knows that all relational things, including meditative experiences, are relative because the being is relative. And once knows that, then all of it is the Dharmakaya. And then one knows that's what one really is. One becomes like vast, infinite, emp infinitely empathetic like a Buddha and will never be harmful to any being. How wonderful. So that's just one marvelous paragraph, which I translated and then re-edited and retranslated for this new edition. And the marvelousness comes from Vajrapani, Kenshin Lada Gansan, and Tsongkhapa, because this is from Tsongkhapa Sumbum, even though it is a dialogue between two other people that he's a witness to. Some parts of it, they even say, may have been done in, when he left to go somewhere nearby, and then his disciples asked Lodra Kenshin to ask Vajrapani some further questions, sort of thing. You know, some of his disciples who had stayed, he'd been spending a few months with Lodra Kenshin. And actually, Dalai Lama's senior teacher, the wonderful Ling Rinpoche, Kapji Ling Tang Rinpoche, one of my root teachers and beloved person in his previous incarnation, and the new young one also, he, whenever you had mentioned Lodra Namka Kenshin's name, he would look like this, like remembering some being in the astral plane or something, and he would reverently bow and fold his hands in, in reverent prayer and gra gratitude, thinking that this is the one who dissuaded Tsongkhapa and his fellow disciples from leaving Tibet after Tsongkhapa's highest enlightenment and going to India on pilgrimage, since they didn't know that Nalanda and the monastery at, Bajra, Bajra, uh, at Bodhga, uh, Bajrasana, you know, Bodhgaya and, and, and Vikramashila and etc., all of them, Ratnagiri, Vallabhi, they were all destroyed by then, by 1400, around the year 1399, 98, 97, around that time. They'd all been wrecked, and so he, he, he got them to dissuade. This is this, by the way, that's the Ling Rinpoche. And this is another wisdom, wonderful publication translation by Tupton Jimbala of um, the uh, biography written by His Holiness. And uh, oh no, and Gavin Kilty, I think. Jimbala and Gavin Kilty, that's right. Jimba and Gavin Kilty, I shouldn't say, just Jimbala. Jimbala supervising Gavin Kilty, I think. Yes. The Jimba introducing, that's right. But Kilty used to work for Jimba. There's a nice smiling picture of Lingam Chia. I don't know if you can see it, but he occasionally smiled. He was a great yogi of a very fierce Buddha form, Manjushri form. So he was often quite serious looking. 
But there he's having a nice grin. He was a wonderful guy. Really, I have moral stories about him, which I won't share all of them right now. Uh, but anyway, that's another great book. His Holiness' his own, because you're supposed to write an autobiography of your teacher. It's like a, a duty, you know, of, 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 a, of a disciple who feels truly grateful for what they learned from their teacher. Okay, so that's the thing. That's this one. That's this thing. So thank you, Life and Teaching. And this one is just to promote, uh, to help wisdom. Although this, uh, you know, American Institute of Buddhist Studies doesn't have a share. This is originally the pro production of, of the Library of Tibetan Works and Archives, wonderful institution in Dharamsala, founded around 1970-71 uh, in Dharamsala when I was actually there. And so I did this for them at that time. And uh, Glenn Mullen helped me, and Burzen was, uh, all different translators were here. Sherpa Tuklu, Kamlan Tuklu, Alex Burzen, Jonathan Landau, and Glenn Mullen are all represented also here in this works. And uh, I was very kid glove in editing them. And, um, and they all remain my friends. We're all good friends. I like all of them very much. I mean, some of them I haven't seen in way too long. But they're all great people. Okay, all the best. Thank you so much. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, including special Dosset tours with Robert Thurman and friends with geographic expeditions, please visit bobthurman.com. Tashi Delek, and thanks for watching.